if they traveled and really got to know each culture, they would see how many more similarities we have okay. and how few differences we have. And I'm always looking for those threads of similarities. Mm -hmm. So beer has become one of those ways as a result <laughs> of the tasting. This is Collective Drift. I'm your host, Erica Verne Knowles. This platform was created to celebrate all women, the beauty of their cultures and international travel experiences. Welcome to Collective Drift. Hi everyone, welcome to episode three and part two of our interview, How to Transform Your Life by Experiencing Other Cultures with Asanya Davidson. If you didn't listen to part one, make sure you go back and listen to that so you can catch up with us. So as a quick recap, Asanya is a child of the world and fashion designer. She's actually the founding director of the Miami Fashion Institute at Miami Dade College, and she has her own fashion line called Circa 24. And we spoke with her about growing up in Jamaica, moving to California, then followed by Miami, and how the Haitian culture and community in Miami impacted her life, as well as becoming a vegan and transitioning into that lifestyle. In this episode, we've actually begun speaking with Asanya about being a fashion designer, how living in West Africa impacted her life and her design. We'll talk about her viewpoint on cultural appropriation, and of course, we'll talk about her favorite places while traveling abroad. So, hey, let's just jump right into it. So I want to transition a bit to you as an artist. Yeah. So you have, of course, the lovely Dash background. Yes. As an artist, you had um, Mrs. Pringle as a teacher there. And mentor. And still and mentor, as a friend. Yes. Thank God. How is she? Let's Yeah, let's take there. How She's is she great. There? Uh, she retired. Miss Pringle retired last year or the year before. Time mm -hmm. flies when you're having fun. Right. And she's been great. You know, I, I vent to her or, <laughs> or I ask her opinion on things. We've had a few Dash kids graduate and, and attend our program. So just getting her insights on things. She sits on the advisory board, which is really great. So for, she, um, for your for program. For my program. Mm -hmm. But it's great to have mentors, women mentors. I've, like I mentioned before, I'm a huge advocate of mentorship. And I think when you start to figure out parts of life, mm -hmm. it's really important to share that information with the next group of young people so that they can maybe accelerate through that portion of life. Right. And so she's always been really great although she'll testify that I didn't like her when I first started at Dash <laughs> but it wasn't that it was just I was sort of still in a bit of culture shock but she's been great and she's all she's always listened to my ideas about the things I'm, I'm interested in and the things I find passion in and kind of help direct me and mm -hmm. you know give me advice and her real input and it's great because she's she's not Jamaican by birth she's mm -hmm. married to a Jamaican and she's Irish background I believe Scottish mm -hmm. or Irish oh don't kill me for that She's been great and she's very familiar with Jamaica and it's just great to have that kind of conversation with mm -hmm. someone. And then I had a mentor when I worked at Macy's as a buyer who was from Sav Lamar in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I believe she was, a she might be the one that was of Irish Jamaican background, but she's from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So I've always had mentors and no, they didn't all look like me. And that was never the point. It was just mm -hmm. sort of having a woman's perspective. Right on certain things. And then as an artist, you're getting input from different cultures as well. So, yeah. So what built your artist's profile, so to say, as a designer? Um, what were the things that were brought in? You know, one, the first thing was my grandmother, who was a uh, seamstress. I think most people can say that their grandparents sewed mm -hmm. when they were younger. And so she was definitely the measure you on Saturday, make you a dress on Sunday. And I always found that was like quite miraculous. Mm -hmm. And then just having that initial interest. And I think my mom and I used to do like Barbie clothes when I lived in California, just like, you know, playing with the machine. And then going to Dash was just like the next level of just sort of experimenting and learning things. And FIT was a, another level of experimenting and learning things. Right. And then when I studied abroad in, in Italy, mm -hmm. that was like a totally different perspective because right. our teachers there were, I think we had one teacher, she was like German, she spoke four languages and she spoke, you know, it was, it was just like this whole world. You realize how big the world is maybe. Right. So all of that had some influence, but it wasn't really till I got to West Africa that I started mm -hmm. to really explore like things like textiles. Okay. I didn't really think of textiles 
much. I knew what they were. I knew mm-hmm. the different types, but I didn't really just think about like how they were mm-hmm. made and the traditional values that they right. had. And you were based in Lagos, right? I was based in Lagos in Acacia on the mainland okay. for about six months. And then I was based in, or five months. And then I was based in Ghana mm-hmm. in Accra okay. for about five, six months. So just you know, the exposure to Adjave, to... To Adjave? Adjave. And so Shibori is like Japanese indigo tie-dyeing. Okay. And Adjave is kind of similar in that nature. It's okay. indigo, it's dyeing with like the indigo dye. And they have different colors, but indigo is like the predominant one. Right. It's with a resist, right. sometimes with like a wax or, or what have you. So they have Adjave, they have Ashoke, which is a woven material. Right. And it can have certain stiffness to it, or it can be a little bit softer. Mm-hmm. There's just all these different types of textiles. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, wow, like we still have these, mm-hmm. you know, these textiles that people are still making. And we should be doing more to right. showcase this brilliance. And so if the Italians can talk about like, you know, their different types of fabrics and right. how amazing they are. Like I didn't, I just didn't see why we weren't doing more to showcase the fabrics right. from most right. Africa or Africa in general. And not even so much the Ankara, which, you know, most people know as they call it an African fabric, but it's not African fabric. Right. I think you're the first person to tell me <laughs> I was, that. I get so annoyed, but I try right. not to because I realize like not not many people are asking questions, but you know, it's Dutch wax. And there's there are uh, African countries that produce their own fabric that look like Ankara or mm-hmm. Ankara like in nature, but it's not a big part of the of the market. And it's definitely not what most people are picking up. Right. You know, it's usually like Chinese knockoffs or some other version of it. If it's, you know, if, if you're getting from the Vlisco st- store, then it's definitely a Dutch wax print, but there's a good chance that no African had any hand in making that fabric or designing so, it. Do you know how? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I mean, like, that's insane, right? I think especially as Americans, we, you know, we're, we're like, okay, yeah, we're representing our I know, African it's such a crazy that. thing how, you know, people, people in fashion, cultural appropriation is just really interesting. Mm-hmm. It's just really interesting because are you culturally appropriating something if you like it? And say, you re- yeah. and you re- and you respect it and you want to wear it. Mm-hmm. So can we call that a cultural appreciation? Can, it's, can yeah, we, there, there's appreciation, it's appreciation and there's appreciation, yeah. and there's appropriation. I right? think there's appropriation and appreciation, and and I think that African Americans have to also recognize when they're appropriating something mm-hmm. without understanding it, mm-hmm. right? So again, appreciation versus uh, appropriation. If mm-hmm. you appreciate it, then do your do your mm-hmm. homework and know who you're supporting. Right. But I've I've gotten into like heated debates with I had a hand dyed collection that was made out when I was in Ghana. Okay. And it was in yellows and some blues and some reds with white. And this woman was just like, Oh, I like the I like the traditional African stuff. And I'm like, What do you well, this was made in Africa by Africans Mm -hmm. and put together by an African. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Yeah, but I like that other stuff. I'm like, But that's Dutch, it's not even African. And Mm -hmm. she's like, Well, it's it's an African. And I'm like, No, it's not. But you, you know, she likes to wear that, mm-hmm. but that money doesn't go back to Africa. It's right. not, it's probably manufactured or knocked off by like a Chinese company because they flood the market. There's like 60 to 70% of the market is mm-hmm. Chinese knockoffs. Oh, wow. And if you want something that's authentic from the country, then when I ask you like, who is the maker? It can't be High Target. It can't be Willisco. It can't be any of the subsidiary brands. Mm-hmm. It can't even possibly be Woudin. I don't, I think Woudin is actually another subsidiary of a bigger company. Mm-hmm. So like, that's the difference between appropriation and appreciation. Mm-hmm. If and it's it's weird because the dashiki, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in the African American culture, you talk about the dashiki, but they wear them in Thailand. Like that's everywhere, right? It's not so. A, they, so I don't you but, don't know that. The thing, but you if you leave. leave here, you you're gonna like get vexed and be like, oh, they're they're wearing our stuff. But I'm like, first of all, dashiki in Africa refers to the cut of your clothes. Mm-hmm. It's not the print. The print is mm-hmm. like in West Africa, it's called Angelina, and other places it's called this, whatever, whatever. But that was created by a Dutch artist for a Dutch company. And it's just been knocked off a bazillion times ever mm. since. So again, it's like you have to kind of recognize that you appropriated something. You mm. didn't know where it came from. And mm. you adopted to your culture to represent something else. But it may not have that same value in other places. And mm. you can't be upset if it doesn't. Right. And so, you know, it's just it's just a lot of misinformation. But it's also like a lot of not doing the research. Because mm. there's enough literature on it at this point because right. you know Ankara has gotten so big and Ankara is the African word for for Dutch print or Dutch right. wax print you okay. know it's it's just like that another phrase but yeah living in West Africa kind of like changed my whole perspective mm-hmm. on fashion and so from then on I just before then I wasn't really big into like 
color or print or, you know, as very much sort of a very well ordered Western Mm -hmm. trained designer. And then going there, I sort of was like, oh my gosh, I've been ignoring this whole Mm -hmm. part of culture and I just need to do more. Absolutely. So if someone wanted to actually have you know, purchase African fabric that, um, mm-hmm. in regardless of who they were, they're African American, they're Caucasian mm-hmm. American, they're Asian, but they want to actually, yeah, yeah, I'm mm-hmm. wearing African fabric. How mm-hmm. how do they find that? How do they know? You can check sites like Adore Lounge, which is on um, Instagram. How do you spell that? Adore A D I R E Lounge. Mm-hmm. So they have Adore from from Nigeria. You need to probably understand a little bit more about the different types of fabrics. Mm-hmm. Ashoke is another type, how they're woven and why they're expensive because they're woven like in very thin strips. Actual kente versus printed kente. Mm -hmm. Kente cloth, kente, actual kente is like a very thin strips of fabric that are sewn together to create a bigger cloth. They run about $300, $400, $500 for just a few yards versus printed kente, which is most most what people think of as kente, like the traditional African kente. When you see a kente, if you see graduates with the little um, shawls, right. that's a proper kente because it's just one of the strips that okay. hasn't been attached to others. So it takes a while for you to sort of know the difference mm-hmm. and then it'll be easier for you to find an actual resource to purchase it. But there are enough vendors from both Ghana and Nigeria that I know of that if you were to go to their Instagram, most of them have Instagram mm-hmm. and can ship to you, especially in Ghana. Nigeria is a little bit more difficult, but Especially in Ghana, they'll ship to you directly. You'll have it in two weeks. It's pretty straightforward. It's just that people don't do the work to Mm -hmm. find out what's what. And then when they're told that they've spent all this money and there's so much pride in owning Mm -hmm. something that they think is authentic to be told, no, that's 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 not real. That's not what it is. I think they get a little annoyed and they rather just tune you out and and not listen because everybody else is on the same page as they are that that is African. And I'm just like, well, well, not really. <laughs> Sorry. Not so much. Sorry, everybody yeah. who has thought they've been wearing African Yeah, fabric. it's, it's, it's not. It's not. Dutch. It's popular. It's definitely. And it's okay to wear Dutch fabric if you like wearing it Dutch is. fabric. That's mm-hmm. what you're wearing. You're wearing it Dutch. Is. And, then, and because of the, because of the new, because of the resurgence and popularity of, of Ankara, like even the Dutch population is wearing more of mm-hmm. it, which is great. You know, it's, it's fantastic, but I just, you need to know where it comes from so you know exactly mm-hmm. what you're representing and what you're representing when you're wearing it. And so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of brands who are doing it. Um, if you want to go high end, like mm-hmm. a designer like Stella Jean, who is half Haitian, half Italian, has a lot of, does a lot of work in West Africa. Mm-hmm. She knows what it represents and she's fully aware of it. She's not appropriating it as though some people who are uneducated have, have said She's fully aware of where the fabric comes from. And so then makes it. let's get back to like uh, uh, the Asanya Davidson mm-hmm. definition of appropriation versus appreciation. Like if you can summarize that. I would say appropriation is it's taking without knowing what mm-hmm. it is and what it represents and who's behind it and who makes it. And just the value. It's just the same thing as if, you know, like I always talk about Japanese break dancers mm-hmm. and how like once they sort of discovered breakdancing and fell in love with it they sort of just took it to this next level mm-hmm. a different level but they but you can go up to them and talk to them about different breakdancers and they would know you know what mm-hmm. i mean not every single one of them obviously but they would know who the major breakdancers are in new york and who's doing what mm-hmm. that's an appreciation for the culture okay. you're not just trying to copy it and then take it somewhere else and pretend mm-hmm. that you're the one that invented it where you know was, was that appreciation or appropriation? That was appreciation. So appreciation. And so appropriation is just to take without knowledge and just, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like be boasty with it and just mm-hmm. like, you don't really know anything. And here you are, you know, box braids versus cornrows. Like, seriously, <laughs> <laughs> you look idiot. You look right. like an idiot, you know, and people are going to call you out on it. And at some point in time, you're going to be a little upset because you're going to walk around saying all this nonsense and someone's going to call you on it. But that's really the difference. If you, I'm not saying you can't wear Blisco prints. They're beautiful. I mean, I love Blisco fabrics. I do. Mm-hmm. But I know who they came from. I, mm-hmm. know, I know who produced it. I know why it got popular in Africa. I know that the Africans are the biggest consumers of it. And that's kind of why the assumption is that mm-hmm. they, they created it. But that's not necessarily the case. And okay. so kind of just knowing the difference. Awesome. And it's interesting to know stuff, guys. Come on, like, read a book. (laughs) Read a book. Google. (laughs) Right? Your best friend. Supercomputer at your fingers. Or listen to our podcast. Yeah. (laughs) Asanya's right here. (laughs) Email me. Feel free to curse me out. So so you you were in Lagos, you were in Accra. What 
were the women like there? What did you learn from them? Oh my gosh. You know, Africans, West Africans are so familiar. Obviously they're familiar because, you know, they're kissing cousins as, as we say in the States, right? Mm -hmm. They're, we're just cousins. We're just distant cousins. They're not even that distant to be quite honest. And so there's just sort of like very strong personalities that felt very familiar, you know, in Jamaica, we call them fish market ladies. <laughs> and if you go to sort of like the market, like I was it Mokola, I can't remember the name, forgive me right now. Mm -hmm. My brain's a bit fried, but going to the markets in, in Lagos mm -hmm. and going to the markets in Ghana, you sort of speak to them the same way. And it was always refreshing. You, you know, you're free, you refer to everyone as auntie or uncle. Mm -hmm. And you sort of are familiar, but you're also respectful. And it's just felt very much the same mm -hmm. as being back in Jamaica. And I remember landing in Nigeria and just looking around and be like, oh, wait. I just, I, for, for a hot second, I was like, man, I was tricked. I think I just flew eight <laughs> hours to Jamaica because this feels really <laughs> familiar. Right. And so the ladies there kind of, again, just kind of reminded me of, you know, strong, mm -hmm. forthright, mm -hmm. just very independent without needing to testify to it. Right. Just independent just by virtue of like, I, you know, I can do this on my own, but I mm -hmm. choose to let you help me kind of thing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And just appreciation for good food and a good time and dancing. I tend to find that West Africans and Africans in general, I find are sort of very young in spirit. Right. And so it doesn't matter if you're 40 or 50, you're going to go out. And if we're going to go out, we're going to go dance and have a good time and whatever. Right. And I do find that there's sort of like a conservatism to Americans after a certain age. Like they right. won't dance. They won't do that. They won't just cut loose. And Africans have a good time. And it's <laughs> it's great. It's such a good thing to just see someone, no matter the age, still mm -hmm. like learning the new dances right, and doing right. the dances. And you think of that age when you're in high school in front of the mirror learning the dances and right. they're doing it on the dance floor right. with a bottle of champagne of course mm -hmm. but just fun Cheers loving. To that. yeah no no <laughs> seriously i had a, such a great time in ghana and nigeria they were such good people and when i was in south africa i had a fantastic time mm -hmm. went to soweto and just good people just really fun mm -hmm. loving and hard working mm -hmm. but the life balancing there i think is is good i know they work really hard but i think mm -hmm. it's it's in a good place like a life balance how so you know just being able to go out and have a good time really having a good time and not thinking about work the next day. You just right. you're out to out. I think as Americans, Americans tend to always focus on what they need to do five minutes from now and six right. minutes from now and seven minutes from now. So you're not really in the moment. You're constantly constantly, mm -hmm. you know, judging the next moment. So it it was really refreshing. And then my last day in Ghana, I was trying to be responsible and be like, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna get home tonight and pack my stuff. I had packed most of my stuff, but I hadn't packed everything. And um, my friend Frank, he was just like, no, you're staying out. You're, we're staying out the whole night. And I'm like, but I have a flight early. He's like, I'll take you to the airport. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And I was just like, oh, this is such a bad idea. I might miss my flight, which I was uh, actually okay with because I loved Ghana so much. But we partied till like sun up and then he took me home and we got my bags and he put them in the car and he like laid on the floor for like 10 minutes while I took a shower and then we were gone <laughs> so to the airport. airport. Right? <laughs> wow. That's a journey. Yeah. So, okay. So we've got a lot of you from Accra and from Lagos. What, and, and I know you just came back from Asia. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to know um, and let the audience know, like, what is your like hands down favorite trip? That you've been on oh man i know my, it's a hard one it's really hard to say that because they're all you know they're all special for different reasons oh my gosh my favorite city my favorite city well i have to say that i did thoroughly enjoy cambodia okay if i have to think of a you know something that's recent ghana accra is really great too and I judge a city for me based on how easy it is to move around okay and so Accra was great because i just I just never felt unsafe. And right. I, I moved around rel relatively easy. Taxis, mm -hmm. just once you get to know Osu and mm -hmm. like those other areas all around mm -hmm. and cantonments, it was really kind of easy to get around. And and, and even when I went to the outskirts and mm -hmm. Uzwa Beach and these other air places, I just, i never felt unsafe. I had a good time. Mm -hmm. Everybody was really kind. So I definitely want to say Accra is definitely on the list, but Ghana in general. And then Cambodia, because again, people were just so lovely and whether you take a tuk-tuk <laughs> or you walk the city of um siem reap is is right. easy to move around in. absolutely i felt like i got to know the place i was only there for a few short days but i feel like i, I got to know it really well just mm -hmm. because i got to walk around 
and it was easier to move around. So I have struggled between those two cities because mm-hmm. they're so, I mean, it's easy to say Paris or one of those other mm-hmm. places. Although I can tell you that I'm not a huge, huge fan of Paris. <laughs> but I, just to be in like those places where you feel comfortable and the people mm-hmm. are lovely and even with a language barrier, you're still able to move around because mm-hmm. everybody is so helpful and so kind. Those probably two are two of my two favorites. favorites. Yeah. Yeah. yeah See, your rape is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it was so easy. Like, my friends are always, oh, how do you travel and be vegan at the same time? Like, most people know how to eat vegetables, guys. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> And so going out there was super, super easy. I, I absolutely loved it. Do you it. remember and any specific restaurants? I just remember going to like a street market there and I wouldn't be able to say where I ate. There was, okay, so in Siem Reap by the night market, there is a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Mexican restaurant there that we ate at. And I think most people would know it because it's, a Mexican restaurant. So there's a Mexican restaurant in Cambodia. In, in Cambodia. Um, in and I had some Morning Star, um, which are like greens that they cooked up. And that was, those were so good and so yummy. Black beans, mm-hmm. and I think rice or something like that. And then there was another place. There was another place where they did the traditional Cambodian performance. Okay. The performance. They served a big buffet style and it was all different types of Asian mm-hmm. cuisine, but all Asian cuisine, okay. which is still a lot of options. And that was a hotel that had like a massive, I don't even know if it was a hotel, but it had a massive dining room. Okay. Massive. I was just like, wow, like if this place was ever, and it ran like clockwork. It was wow. just like the best service. I just didn't expect to get mm-hmm. great service with that many people mm-hmm. around. Right. They were on point. Okay. It was great. It's, yeah. it's good to have good service. No, it's, it's great. Important. It's but important. It's, I think people always assume you go to a developing country and somehow they just don't know how to do things. And, mm-hmm. I, and I've gone to so many developing countries and they do things better than mm-hmm. we do in the States. I think yeah. definitely it does <laughs> I mean, and, and it's a part of their culture. Yeah. Like services to be org- is, and services yeah. are part of their culture. And kindness. I got my last tattoo in Cambodia, traditional bamboo cut tattoo. And mm-hmm. just that whole process alone mm-hmm. can be, I'm sure it can be quite terrifying to get a tattoo in another country mm-hmm. um, that you're not familiar with. And just to get the tattoo by hand, bamboo. Right. And also to go and get the, you know, to go and get the blessing afterwards at a different location that's like out in the cut. Mm-hmm. You have to have some sort of feeling of trust for the culture. And they're just so kind. I mean, amazing. Just amazingly kind and open and friendly and just, yeah, super zen. (laughs) You come back feeling like I'm doing something wrong in my life because I should be as zen as they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And then um, you said Accra. So a mm-hmm. lot of people are going back for, I think it was for New Year's Eve. Yeah. The this, year of the return. The year of the return. Right? Yeah. So what are some recommendations? Since you were there for a while, I imagine you have a few. Oh my gosh. Favorite places. Yeah. Osu is probably the main area where people go out mm-hmm. at night. And there is a bar, which anybody who's been in Osu know it's, it's this bar slash music venue mm-hmm. that is on a, it's on a, like an alleyway street. Street mm-hmm. or side street. I think I've been there. Yeah, it's uh-huh. on a side street. Uh-huh. If you've been in Osu, you know this place because it's open till the crazy hours. Right. And there's always an amazing DJ playing like High Life or mm-hmm. one of those genres of music. Is it like outdoor, indoor? Yeah, kind of? outdoor, indoor. Yeah, outdoor, indoor. Very little indoor, lots of outdoor. Okay. <laughs> I want to say like it can stretch into the middle of the street. Mm-hmm. But that's probably the one place that I think everybody goes to in the evening and you sit down and, you know, they have a few small bites right. on the menu and they have Sobolo, which mm. is their version. I would probably call it the probably the original version of what we call Sorrel in Jamaica. Okay. It, it's, a, it's the same origin with the um, mm. hibiscus flowers. And so you can have that. There's like a couple of different beers that are available and um, obviously in, in Os- Osu and, and non-alcoholic and alcoholic drinks mm. that are available there that you have to try. And that's the other thing. So I went to Ireland Mm -hmm. Christmas before last, Mm -hmm. I think. And I went to the Guinness factory because you have to go to the Guinness. I'm Jamaican. (laughs) And so Jamaicans feel like they invented Guinness and Mm -hmm. they think that we produce Guinness. But apparently so that the Africans in Africa is the, I think, the either the largest or the second largest consumers of Guinness. Mm -hmm. And they also think it's theirs. The same thing with Coca-Cola, because I used to live in Peru. I ended up teaching this guy that was the founder of the second largest marketing firm. Yeah. Majority of Peruvians think Coca-Cola is a Peruvian Yeah, isn't that crazy? And Coca-Cola purchased Inca Cola, which was a Peruvian Peruvian company. But but now that's not even Peruvian. Yeah, it's crazy because the guy who was our tasting guide was like, oh yeah, you know, a lot of, they have a lot of Africans who come to a tasting and he's like, yeah, they think that Guinness is theirs. And I'm like, well, we thought it was ours. He's like, he's like, he's like, but that's great to have a drink that 
you feel like it's part of your culture mm -hmm. and it not necessarily be That's so all beast marketing right <laughs> but you know guinness is i mean i've i've grown up with guinness my grandfather obviously mm -hmm. drank guinness in jamaica back in the day when they actually had probably yeast in it as it doesn't have so much anymore or they used to put yeast in a bottle. So you used to actually get extra iron out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of Jamaicans think like Guinness makes you strong. <laughs> I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, growing up with Guinness punch is Guinness mixed with condensed milk. But just sort mixed of with what? condensed milk. Oh, okay. Guinness mixed with condensed milk. Good stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I'll try some. But just being there and then, you know, talking about like the different beers that are in different markets mm -hmm. based on the markets that what they like and what's popular there. And there are certain beers that you can get Guinness beers. You can get in Africa that you cannot get anywhere else because okay. their market is so robust. And so I didn't, I wasn't a beer drinker much before. Obviously mm -hmm. I would have the occasional Heineken or Guinness or whatever, or red stripe mm -hmm. more, more or less. But after that, I started to think about like the differences in the different markets. And so now I'm a bigger connoisseur of beer, not because I love beer, but because I want to just taste the difference by culture. Really? Like I just, yeah, because Americans drink the most light beer, which right. is like, uh, you know, yeah. I'm like, I'm not a big light beer I just person. got back from Germany. Talk about beer. It's yeah. pretty heavy there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I know. Oktoberfest. I'm, I'm tempted. But okay. I just don't, I just don't feel my face going numb. But just. That's another thing about culture, right? So what is similar in certain places, mm -hmm. what is dissimilar, mm -hmm. there's always way more similarities, right? which is one of the things that I think people, if they traveled and really got to know each culture mm -hmm. as much as they could, because obviously if you didn't grow up in it, you'll never know it as well as the person who did. They would see how many more similarities we have right. and how few differences we have. And I'm always looking for those threads of similarities. Mm -hmm. So beer has become one of those ways as a result <laughs> of the tasting at the Guinness factory, the original Guinness factory in Ireland. With living in Accra and living in Lagos, what did you bring back that is a part of you now? Personal? That's like not necessarily a thing, but like now is a habit. Is this something that you do? I'm definitely, so one of the things- Or maybe people, it's a part of your art, right? Well, Definitely a part of my designing now is just sort of incorporating references mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with, cultural references, whether it be from my travels or something that comes from my own personal culture. But just also understanding this concept of like being an expat. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we struggle with a lot, especially in, in the U.S., coming from other countries is, is identity and mm -hmm. wanting to fit in, but also not wanting to walk away from who we are, mm -hmm. you know, from our culture. and. It's been interesting to see other expats deal with it as well, right? You know, mm -hmm. and the idea of what expat means and immigrant versus expat and right. who gets to use the terms, right? Right, right. And it's been great to see how everyone does their own version of it. But I would, mm -hmm. I would say the one thing, the biggest thing I've gotten from just traveling so much to different places and different cultures has been like, you are the only person that can define who you are. Right. And if you want to identify as Irish Jamaican or just Irish or Jamaican or whatever, that's mm -hmm. your prerogative. I've always identified as Jamaican and people are like, oh, you don't sound like a Jamaican. I'm like, if I knew that was the only criteria, I would talk to you in Patwa and we could just chat to you feel mm -hmm. more comfortable with me being Jamaican. <laughs> right. But you can't go by other people's identity of what it means. You have to let that person mm -hmm. identify themselves. Right. And that's been one of the big takeaways. And so habits have been more, be more thoughtful in the things that I, I absorb into my life and mm -hmm. the things that I move away from. Being more thoughtful in the things that I adopt into my life mm -hmm. and the things that I move back to. Right. Whether it be like a habit that my grandmother used to have, which mm -hmm. is like cooking meals on Sundays, which is universal in a lot of places. Or just, you know, having time for friends, mm -hmm. sitting down and having like small bites with friends, things that you are reminded of that are important when you're in these other places that you don't do at home. Right. When you realize, why don't I do this at home again? Like, mm -hmm. it's important. Right. So just just little habits that I've picked up, but also just the way they approach living in two worlds, because okay. it really is. It's not easy leaving your home country and then going back. You know, there's resentment for whatever reason. Sometimes it's open arms, but a lot of times it isn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you feel native, but you don't. Right. It's just, and it's just compounded by other people telling you who you are and mm -hmm. who you aren't. And it's it's important that you just sort of hold your own ground and not really listen to them because you can't define someone. You can have someone that we like, you know, we have these issues right now with, with people being deported who were, you know, probably came here when they were 
a year old. Right. And this is a culture they know and you're telling them they're not this or that and you send them back and they're completely fish out of water. So it can be about where you were born. It just has to be about what you feel is. Mm-hmm. And who you are. And who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's been probably the biggest lesson over the years. Awesome. So you're in America now. You live in Miami. Mm-hmm. So Miami is a place of vacation. And we have Oof. plenty of opportunities to staycation <laughs> here and have uh-huh. access to multiple cultures, multiple types of cuisine, yeah. the arts and everything. What are your, some of your favorite places here? Wow. Well, Screaming Carrots, for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, I'm there usually once a week. God help me. <laughs> in my bank account and i'm sorry broward county we're in hollywood we're not in miami yeah yeah and we're, so we're in south florida yeah yes, we're in, in south Scream- florida in, in screaming carrots is in holland yeah so i'll do i'll do you one in each each county so mm-hmm. miami dade well there's two places and they're owned by the same company i think <laughs> there is sakaya which is a korean barbecue spot and they have the most amazing brussels sprouts ever mm-hmm. love their brussels really? sprouts they do better I love than their sugar br- canes yeah, I'm going to go that far. Oh, I love their Brussels sprouts. That's a hard one. I do. <laughs> and then there's Black Brick, mm-hmm. which is across the quad. It's like a green grass across the quad from them. And they have like some spicy dishes with like vegetables and everything. Mm-hmm. And they sometimes put tofu in it. Is that in Midtown? Where is that? Yeah, they're right across okay. from each other. So those two are, are, are two of my favorite um, places. In in the design district, there's a place called Michael Genuine. Mm-hmm. And they have some great options on their on their menu as well. Their falafels are off the chain. Mm-hmm. And for dessert, oh yeah, don't forget Koyo Taco. Their mushroom tacos are amazing. Yes. And but I want to say mm-hmm. that for dessert, the vegan donut, whatever the vegan donut is at Salty Donuts, <laughs> is it is it like just save all your calories if you can. Right. Because that is, that is, yeah, that's it. Right Mm -hmm. now they have like a strawberry lemonade donut. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. I'm going to have to try it. It's really good. And then what about experiences in Miami? So either museums or a place to dance or just a place to hang out. Well, the, 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 the experience wise, I tend to be more in downtown Broward for that or Mm -hmm. downtown for Lauderdale. You know, Ginger Bay are usually around carnival time has a great live band. Mm -hmm museums that i like to visit the last visit i had museum wise or even art galleries yeah well the the perez is amazing i mean it's a beautiful space i'm trying to think there was a where did we go last time that was like super amazing and we loved it oh it's not in south florida though sorry it's actually in west florida it's in uh, sarasota the ringling the ringling museum in west florida it's got to be the most fun museum you'll ever go to really it's a circus museum and so South Florida is where the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus originated from. And so in Sarasota, which is not necessarily South Florida, but in Sarasota, yeah, there is a, a museum. It's a quick drive. It's about three and a half hours. Yeah. So there's a museum there dedicated just to like circus history. Mm-hmm. And then they have like a whole diorama mm-hmm. of the circus and the history of the circus. Okay. But it's like a massive diorama. Like you could spend hours just staring okay. at it. And then there's another museum that is within walking distance, a fine arts museum. And they have currently like a Victoria and Albert borrowed display. It's just, it's just a great little drive. I think Sarasota is like an hour away. Mm-hmm. It's a great little drive. And I love, I love going to that museum and the Dolly Museum over there is fantastic right. too. Absolutely. The Dolly is fantastic. They had a, a display of his work. They've, they're doing like AR, VR, mm-hmm. uh, integrated technology with some of his paintings. It's just really like mm-hmm. really, really good, good stuff. So that was something that I did recently that I really enjoyed. But there's always like random things you can do. South Florida has a lot going on. So whether it be, you know, paintballing or Mm -hmm. like the new indoor skydiving or I've done like pottery classes. I've done, you know, it just really depends on what you want to get into. You can go out salsa dancing every night of the week if you want to, if that's your if that's your thing. I like going to balls every once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. I love a little like Haitian culture night. And when we can, you know, when when there's a carnival in town in October, we definitely hit up all of So the, Miami Broward Carnival. Yeah, Miami mm-hmm. Broward Carnival. We definitely hit up a mm-hmm. lot of the parties. The Breakfast Fet is mm-hmm. by far one of our favorites that we're consistently mm-hmm. at every single year. That starts at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are the kind of the things I get into. If you could ask like any woman a question, what, what are things that you want to know from other women? I kind of want to understand, you know, how they're dealing with life. Mm-hmm. I think women juggle a lot mm-hmm. just by nature of being a woman. 
And I'm always curious as to how other people are doing it. I, I assume I'm, I'm doing okay. Mm-hmm. I like to be doing better. Right. <laughs> so I like to get input, input from other people as to what's working for them and what isn't working for them. And more often than not, I find out that we're, we're a lot of us are doing the same thing or trying the same thing or experiencing the same thing. Right. So especially from older women, I love to sort of mm-hmm. like get their input on just life and the things they figure out and they've been pretty consistent the advice i've gotten and the information they've shared with me and i w- i do wish more older women would share their experiences mm-hmm. with younger women instead of sort of just sort of like kissing their teeth and be like you know i'm not gonna bother with you or anything i'm like please share your information share. Let, like please why, why did i have to experience this yes. without you telling me yeah but i just like to understand how women are dealing with life because i do think we carry a whole lot of weight mm-hmm. and we're left to carry that weight mm-hmm. and we think we have to carry it alone so i think it's always a good way to kind of break break into sort of like how are you handling how are you dealing with life mm-hmm. and then how would you define a woman what is a woman to you <sighs> the alpha and the omega yeah she's the beginning and the end and it'd be awesome if more women took ownership of that Mm -hmm. although i think it can be really scary to recognize your power Mm -hmm. and i wish there were more women helping other women recognize their power i I don't know i do know i understand how we got to where we are (laughs) but i think just recognizing how just amazing to be able to create life, to be able to carry life, to be mm-hmm. able to do the things we do, nurse life. Outside of that, just how we exist and and, and how we operate and our, our abilities, our mental abilities, all these other things that mm-hmm. I think we don't get as much credit for. Raising families that aren't our families, but raising families and taking care of families, that nurturing aspect. I just think we need to probably own that we are the beginning and the end of it. You know, okay. at the end of it, like without us, there is not, none of this is happening. Mm-hmm. And that's OK to own that. You mm-hmm. know, some I want to say the other sexes owned it for a while and they haven't really earned it. <laughs> so I think we so just, it's time to take it back. You know what I'm saying? Take reclaim it, our time. Let's just sort of reclaim <laughs> it. Let's, let's, let, let's bring it back a little bit. But just take, stepping into your power is a very big deal. Right. And it's hard to do because it's scary. And having other women to support you is important and having people around you that understand that and push you to that that space mm-hmm. is important and i think having a tribe that does that is important and so you know just just recognize that you're the beginning and the end like okay so you it. got that that's mm-hmm. the final message <laughs> you are the beginning and the you end are. if you're yeah. a woman that's watching this yeah if you're a guy <laughs> you're like the in between the comma and the, the apostrophe and all of that stuff. It's good to have a comma every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, you know, so you don't have a run-on sentence. <laughs> you gotta have that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much You're for welcome. your time. Thank you. I know, I love it. I love talking about all things travel. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, and it's a wrap. Bye. Thank you for listening to part two of our episode with Asanya Davidson. If you'd like to find Asanya, you can find her at circa24forever.com. That's C-I-R-C-A 24 F-O-R e-v-e-r.com or at circa 24 forever on instagram of course you can follow me on instagram facebook and on the website at collective drift looking forward to speaking with you soon and of course leave your comments below love to have your feedback bye